Good morning. So, um, this morning, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you can't hear the feedback that I'm getting from my camera next door. Um, today, we're going to talk about hooping, 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 hooping. Good morning, Barb. And who is this? Rusty's Needles and Twisted Thread. Oh, Mandy, good morning. And again, good morning, Barb. Um, so listen, we're going to talk about hooping. We have, we have Cindy here too, and Frank. Frank, Frank, is it afternoon there? Oh, I'm so glad I'm not keeping you up all hours of the night. Um, as you can see, or hear, I'm still a bit nasally, you know, from, from being sick last week. So here we go. This is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about hooping. When you buy your first embroidery machine, unless, unless you've won the big mega jackpot, millionaire, billionaire jackpot, you can't generally always afford to buy all those fancy things. So you work with what you've got. Am I better? Cindy wants to know if I'm better. Um, I feel better. Um, I feel better. I'm just real nasally and congested. I'm taking decongestants for it, you know, trying to clear the sinuses all the time. But, um, but overall, I'm good. Frank says it's 4 o'clock there. By the time we get done, Frank, it'll be dinner time. Okay, so you can't afford all the fancy doodads. You can't afford the magnetic hoops and the fancy clamps and all the, you know, all the extras. So you work with what you've got. And what you've got is um, the plastic hoop that comes with your equipment. Now, back 100 years ago when I first started, hooping was a challenge for me. I had puckering, um, things were too loose, things were too tight. So one, one weekend, I did a study of hooping. I had some fabric. I did a lot of research online, watched a lot of YouTube videos. And this is what I found. I found... And this works especially well if you're going to repeat hooping, meaning you're going to say you've got a bunch of t-shirts to do and um, you need to do them one right after the other. I do something that I call calibrating my hoop. What I do, oh, speaking of calibrating the hoop, what I do... Cindy is absolutely right. When you're ready, when your budget can handle it, invest in a hooping station. We can talk about some of those um, uh, at some time in the future. Basically what it is, is it's a, a background platform that will hold your hoop in the same place and allows you to put the shirt or the garment over it and place it in the same place every time. Okay, so calibrating the hoop. I'm going to switch over to my camera, which is over here. It, um, oh, there we are. Oh, look. Hi. Hello. Okay, so I set the camera up over here. Do I have a Viking barb? Yes, I do. In fact, um, I started my embroidery with Brother Machines and then crossed over to the Viking brand because I thought it had a superior stitch quality. Um, I had two top-of-the-line Epic machines that I sold and invested in my embroidery, my commercial machines, but I kept my um, Topaz 50. I love that machine. It's great. 
So yes, um, I have the hoops from my topaz here. So basically what I do, the first thing I do when I want to calibrate my hoop is I'll open up, I'll open up the hoop so that it's all kind of loosey goosey. Yep, loosey goosey. And we're working with knit fabrics today because, you know, those things, if you stretch them bad, they will pucker terribly. So I put my stabilizer in place. This is an all stitch brand. It's their classic stabilizer. I like it because um, it's a cutaway, but it's also very lightweight, very strong. Um, it's very strong. And uh, it, it's kind of got a bit of a no-show quality to it. So when I'm ready, I put my stabilizer over the hoop. The hoop is open. And I just throw the fabric on there. Not worried about how it lays in there. Not worried about anything. You know, I might smooth it out a little bit. And then I'll pop my hoop in there. And... Of course, this one was a little tighter than I thought it would be. And then I would tight the hoop, just finger tight. Not real tight, because I want to be able to pop this out. But what you see here, once I pop it out, is that, and I don't know if you can see it, there's now a gap here. There's a gap between the inner hoop and the outer hoop. And what that is, what that gap is, that's the space that the fabric and the stabilizer takes up. Now, I can lay my hoop in, lay my stabilizer in place, lay my fabric smooth, and hoop. Now, I like to hoop from the top down. So I'll pop the top of the hoop in there, and then I'll walk it down in place. Now, how do I know if my fabric's in there right? I do a snow plow. I take three fingers, start at the bottom, and lightly pressing, I look at the fabric, and I see that it's shifting. Do you see that? And we'll do that again. That tells me that I have not hooped my fabric correctly. Going back to Barb and her Viking Ruby, she says it's a 20-year-old machine and runs like new. It was her first embroidery machine. I know. They are awesome, awesome quality machines. And Cindy, she says that her tech from GSG Supplies tested hooping dry fit polos and that she found that if you press the hoop from top to bottom as opposed to side to side, it's better for not stretching. That is exactly, that is exactly right, Cindy. So... We're going to lay this again because remember we had too much fabric inside the hoop, but we don't want to stretch. We don't want to stretch. We want to just make sure that it's nice and smooth. See if we put the fabric in the hoop and we smooth it out and we work top to bottom. I'm going to just pull this a little bit. I don't want to stretch it, but I want to make sure it's positioned correctly. And I'm doing this before I tighten it. Seat it and push. I still have a little bit here, but remember this is a knit. So once I have it hooped, I just tighten it in place. And we're good to go. Now, I want to show you what happens. I want to show you what happens um, back 100 years ago when I first started. 
I would put my fabric in place. I would pop the hoop in place. I would see that it was still all kind of loosey goosey. So I would pull and I would tighten that fabric. Can you see that? I would pull and I would tighten it so that it was all perfectly smooth. And then you know what happens? I would stitch and I'm using a marker, fabric marker for um, our simulated stitches. And we're stitching 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 and we're stitching. And then when I pop this out and the fabric all relaxes, the density is too tight because I had stretched it and now it's not stretched. So all those stitches that went into the fabric when it was stretched are now all bunched up. And it's causing the puckering. Does that make sense? Are we getting this? So I lay it in there. Of course, you want to make sure that you actually cover the hoop. Of course, with a knit, I would use either a fusible stabilizer. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate the, the feedback. I would use a fusible stabilizer and um, fuse it to the back of my fabric or a light spray, a light spray of um, fabric adhesive because, you know, the fabric, the knit fabric is stretch. And every time the foot bounces up and down on that fabric, it's causing a stretch and a shifting. So the stabilizer with the um, the fusible stabilizer or the adhesive will help secure that. I refer to it as a it, as an like anchoring a boat in a lake. If you have a boat in a lake and it's floating and you throw out one anchor, you might anchor one end, but the rest of it is still going to float. So you anchor another end. You still have some floating. But if you use the um, fusible or the adhesive, you've locked that boat in place. And yes, there's still going to be some waves, but it's going to be minimized. And that is what our goal is, to minimize the shifting of the fabric as it's stitching. So... That is, um, that's also our argument for, um, our argument for, um, sorry, I just lost my words. Those of you that know me know that that happens. Oh, our argument for hooping versus floating. Floating is just that. It's floating. You float the fabric. It is not hooped. And when, when you hoop just the stabilizer and you throw the fabric on top, that's a loosey-goosey boat. It's going everywhere. I know people use their sticky back stabilizer. Uh, personally, I prefer not to use sticky because sticky is just that sticky. It sticks to everything. Um, but I don't float. If if it can be hooped, hoop it. That's where your best stabilization is going to happen. That's where it's um, it's going to be properly anchored. And it's not going to be uh, sailing away with every stitch that you create. Let's see. Cindy says that she uses Gunnell's Action Back 
on her really stretchy fabrics. If I need more stability, like you, I spray a little adhesive. Yep. Can't hurt to have that stuff in your in your room, in your supplies. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about hooping. Until you get to the point, and maybe, you know, there are those out there that find no need to invest in those fancy magnetic hoops or clamps or, um, you know, all those specialty uh, equipment pieces. I'm going to cough here. Forgive me. to stream there i am yay happy dance cindy you're absolutely right having a good logo digitized for stretchy fabrics is a game changer i have um and you guys may have heard of him eric campbell he is, he's a, 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 he's got a long history in the industry, digitizing, embroidery. Um, he's been around for many years. He is, <laughs> thanks, Rusty. Ta-da. Oh, Mandy, thank you. Ta-da. So, um, Eric Campbell, uh, I've followed him, his work for uh, several years. I try to take uh, as many educational classes as I can. And he is one of the teachers out there in the um, trade show world that I, I take classes from. And um, there I go again. I start rambling along and I can't remember what I was going to say about Eric Campbell and his teaching. It was really good, though. Oh, I remembered. Had to go back and look at Cindy's Cindy's um, comment about stretchy fabrics. Eric has said that if you can digitize. No, we didn't. Back a long time ago, we didn't have stretchy fabrics in commercial embroidery. And Frank... Frank, have you heard of him somewhere? You know, he does that podcast, um, that video podcast on Fridays called The Take Up. Uh, he can be found here and on YouTube. Excellent instructor, great communicator. So what did he say? He said that if you can digitize, if you can digitize for um, PK fabric, which is a, a polo knit. If you can digitize something for a four-way stretch knit, that that same um, design file can embroider on everything, anything. Because the knit is so stretchy, you have to handle it with such care. You want to remember that when you're digitizing, when you're embroidering, you are stuffing two threads for every needle penetration into that fabric, into fabric that's already made flat. It's perfect just the way the manufacturer made it. And here we want to go and stuff more thread in there. So it will stretch and it will push out. But if you can digitize and stitch on that stretchy fabric, that whole design um, can be stitched on anything. And it will still, you know, it'll still look great. Um, I'm going to cough again. Sorry. Hang on. <coughs> Throat's a bit scratchy. Gosh, it's a good thing. And I'm not contagious now. 
<laughs> but it's a good thing this is not um, transmittable over the internet. So while we're here, anybody have any questions on hooping? Ta-da, hooping. Hooping, not such a bad thing. Hooping. Did you get the um did you get the the uh headline? Hoop it, hoop it good. Yeah, that's the Devo Whip It uh theme song. Yeah, you got it. Let's see, what does she say? I know we're talking about hooping, but knowing the pathing for your design on stretchy fabric is a must. Oh yeah, very much so. When you're digitizing and where possible, when I digitize, this is what I try to do. I still try to digitize for center out because, um, because of the push and pull. Hoop it. <laughs> you like that, huh? Mandy's over there singing um, hoop it to uh, Devo's whip it. I can hear her. I can hear her in my head. So anyways, um, if, if you're, if you're digitizing for a stretch and you digitize this element way up here, and then you bounce back way down here, and then you come into the center, you are pushing and pulling that, um, oh, Woody, happy. Hold on just a second. You're pushing that fabric in and out and back and forth, and it's going to pinch, and it's going to buckle up, and you're going to stitch over the top of it, and it's not going to give you the results you want. So when I digitize, I try to digitize center out. Now, um, Woody here, and welcome, is asking how to hoop a beanie. Um, I hoop beanies flat. I do um, I do not use a, a round cylinder hat hoop when I hoop a beanie. What I do and I I, I hoop a beanie pretty much the same way I hoop everything else. I'll calibrate my um, I'll calibrate. Oh, let me put the camera back on. There we are. I'll calibrate my hoop. Remember, we open it up really wide. We take our project, in this case, a beanie. So how am I going to simulate a beanie? I'm going to take my fabric piece that I have here, and I'm going to fold it over and fold it over. Okay, I've laid my stabilizer in place because even with your beanie, you need the stabilizer. And the beanie is not going to fill the whole hoop. The beanie is only going to fill a portion of the hoop. So I try to get as much in there as I can. In this case, this is our, um, our edge of our knit beanie. And then I put my top hoop in place. And again, I calibrate that hoop. I'll tighten it up. I'll pop it out. Here, we'll see the calibration. It's still kind of loose. See that? That's to accommodate the, the fabric in this case a knit beanie. I'll put my stabilizer back in place. I'll smooth out my beanie knit. The trick with doing a beanie consistent, consistently is um, to make sure that you place the edges in the same place with ever hooping. Cindy's making a point here. She's saying, what about a topper on your beanie? I know it can depend on the logo. Yes, you can put a topper. And I suggest putting a topper in the hoop 
with the stabilizer and the knit because that way the um, topper is not shifting around. So we've got our knit in the hoop. And again, we want to start at the top and walk our way down. Once the hoop is seated, we'll tighten it so that it's firm. And now we can put that on our machine and we can stitch our design. Remember, if this is your edge, you want to make sure that you've placed your beanie in the hoop correctly so that when you take it all out and you fold the cuff up, if it's a cuff, that it's laying in the correct direction. Let's see, what else have we got here? Cindy was going back and saying that she floated bags yesterday. Not much of a floater. In the commercial world, um, quantity is my world, not at single items. Barb replied that floating items is not her favorite either. And Frank, you're right. Beanies work great in a mighty hoop, which um, I guess I could put myself back up here, huh? Which is a magnetic hoop. Um, but again, if you don't have a magnetic hoop, you can do it with your uh, standard machine hoop. Cindy says that um, floating does slow down production, and it does. And it does increase the frustration level. Okay. Uh Woody, you're welcome. Did you have any other questions about that? Cindy had um, a, a thought she wanted here. Should you, should you already have your hoop set? I know it's different for my hoops, but I thought if you tighten the hoop after, you can change things. And you can. That's why we're calibrating. We don't, um, maybe I missed that part. I use a three turn when I calibrate. I will tighten the hoop tight and then I'll back it off three turns so that when I go back and hoop, I am turning it back three turns to get it back to um, the tight hoop that I need. You're very welcome, Woody. Anytime you have any questions, just um, find me. I'd be happy to answer. Turn the beanie inside out if they have a cuff. Yes, the, yes exactly, Frank. You turn it inside out, and then um, remember your cuff, this is going to be your fold line. No, I did it again. This is going to be your fold line on a cuff, and it's going to fold over, so you want to make sure that your design... reads right side up. Now, let me pop this off and we'll do another one. If your um if your beanie does not have a cuff, you're going to hoop it again so that the cuff is toward or I'm sorry, the end is towards the center. You're going to hoop it And then you're going to, I'm trying to write up and down. You're going to um, stitch your design upside down.
Cindy's saying that if I have a stack of hoops, you have the tensions all set so you don't have to mess with them. Cindy, that would work if you're only ever working with one fabric type. If all I'm ever doing are beanies, then yes, I could have all of them set for beanie. If all I'm ever working on is a t-shirt, then yes, I could have them all set for t-shirt or cotton fabric, whatever that single fabric is, whatever that single fabric is. But because most of us have different product lines, uh, we do t-shirts, we do jackets, we do beanies, that all requires a different setting on the hoop. And that's where you need to make sure that um, your hoop is set for each one. Yes, you're right. You can pre-calibrate all of your hoops for the job you're working on at that time. That makes it great because then all you have to do is pull the next hoop over, hoop, um, lay your stabilizer, Lay your fabric, pop the hoop in place. Ta da! All right. So, any thoughts on next week? And here's something I want to um, I want to suggest. At some point, I would like this to be. I would like to be able to do a true conversation, live conversation. So what I was thinking, and of course we would have a subject matter, um, we could do little demonstrations like we did today, but I would like to invite one or two people to come in here with me and we could actually have a true conversation. The audience, those of you that are not on screen, are not in the broadcast, you can post your comments, you can post your, um, your questions, and then we can talk about them. Is that something that you uh, would be interested in? Is that something that we can set up? And here I go again. <coughs> so sorry. Um, and again, with that, we, uh, we need a subject for next week. Let's see. I had, yes, please. Um, okay. We can set something like that up. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. I had a list of things. Where did it listing? Oh, thank you, Cindy. Cindy thinks that would be fun. Okay, so next week, if we don't have anything else, if we don't have any other suggestions, there was a question that came up earlier this week that um, I think we should we should work on. People are stitching out dad hats out there, and they're having a hard time with them because dad hats are all kind of floppy and, you know, flippy floppy. So I was thinking to talk about how to structure an unstructured hat before you embroider it. Interested? I think, yeah. Where, which hand am I? Yeah. All right. So um, with that, I will formulate a win for our live conversation. And unless you've come up with something else, Frank, are you? Um, Frank, we're going to do, we're going to do that. We're going to structure, unstructure hats next week. Uh, and uh, if anybody has any thoughts, any questions, uh, any suggestions, just pop off in the comments. I'll get them. I'll read them. I'll reply. I'm good that way. All right. Let's see. Cindy, Cindy wants to make a special request that um, uh, that we do our live conversations, live conversations in the winter because she's got a Saturday morning obligation out in nature on her bicycle. 
And Woody, you got it. Dad hats next week. Be here. Okay, everybody. I'm going to sign off now. Let me go get my little music thing. You know, where'd it go? It doesn't take long. All right, then. Wasn't that fun? Do you have more questions? Do you want to learn something new? Join me at quicktostitch.com for coffee and conversation, and we'll talk about it. Embroidery machines, designs, and business. Hope to see you soon. Bye now.